Um, I'm very, very pleased to present uh, the next speaker, uh, Amy Childress. Amy was one of my first PhD students when I was a professor at UCLA, and uh, after graduating in 1997, she went to the University of Nevada, Reno. She was a department chair, and just very, very recently, she moved to the University of Southern California, USC. You're moving from UCLA to USC. <laughs> very bad. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so Amy is a professor there in the, the, the in Civil and Environmental Engineering and also director of the Environmental Engineering Program at USC. Uh, Amy is one of the pioneers in uh, emerging membrane uh, contactor processes and hybrid membrane systems. These are, as you'll see, a membrane-based system that operate uh, by different driving force. Uh, Amy served as the president of the Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors in uh, 2008. She won many awards. Uh, she is in this session, but she is not a, a Clark Prize laureate yet. <laughs> and uh, it's my pleasure, really, to introduce you, Amy. It's an honor to be here today. I'm excited to give this talk on advanced membrane systems. Uh, so a brief outline of the talk. First, I'll give you just a little bit of background, and uh, then I'm going to talk about three projects. I tried to narrow it down. I thought maybe one project, but then I really liked all three of these projects. They're at neat points, so I went with three projects. So it'll be a little bit topical in that sense. Um, and of course the impetus for this work is the need for water and energy sustainability. Uh, the upper map shows regions where we need to turn to maybe seawater desalination or wastewater reclamation for our water supply. And of course in doing this we also want to decrease our greenhouse gas emissions. So both of these are leading us to consider new technologies. Um, I'm going to talk about one technology in a little bit more detail, and that's direct contact membrane distillation. It's, you're going to see it in the next two projects that I discussed, so that's why I'm going to go in a little bit of detail on it. So in uh, membrane distillation and direct contact membrane distillation, you have a warm feed stream on one side of a hydrophobic microporous membrane. Water itself does not pass through the pores. Instead, water vapor evaporates through the pores. So what you get is a clean distillate stream, a very clean distillate stream. And the key, one of the key advantages of membrane distillation is that unlike reverse osmosis that has you know, pressure driving it, it has a temperature or vapor, vapor pressure driving force. So if we look at vapor pressure as a function of temperature, there's actually a black line under here that's pure water. The blue line that you see is 35 grams per liter sodium chloride. And in our labs, we'll run maybe with a 40 degree feed, 20 degree distillate. So you can see the driving force. It's small, but it's a microporous membrane, so it gives you a decent flux. Now, if you increase the salinity of the water that you're trying to treat to 210 or even 300 grams per liter, you think about trying to treat that with RO, and it would either need very high energies or perhaps even be impossible. So with membrane distillation, your driving force is only decreased slightly, even at those very high concentrations. So it's this advantage that's led to uh, a lot of recent interest, uh, driving force not significantly reduced, that's uh, led to a lot of the recent interest in membrane distillation for treatment of high fouling and scaling feed waters. And that includes produced waters in the oil and gas industry, valuable metal recovery and mineral harvesting. Uh, and that I show here, this is work by Zahi Kath, where he was working on Great Salt Lake water that was starting with a concentration of 150 grams per liter. He was concentrating it up to over 300 grams per liter, basically just expediting the evaporation process that they let happen in evaporation beds. Uh, the third is concentration of RO brines. That's been talked about a little bit today. And in our research group, we worked with Carollo and Eastern Municipal Water District to concentrate RO brines. And the best results we were getting were 20 grams per liter up to more than 80. And this was achieving near zero liquid discharge. So that's where kind of the, the interest is in membrane distillation right now. 
Now I want to tell you about two other advantages of membrane distillation that have led us into some different directions. And the first of those is that it produces a distillate quality product. If we look at, for example, low pressure RO, we know that we get passage, and this is estrone, so an endocrine disrupting compound, and this is rejection or retention and versus time. And we know we get passage of these contaminants through reverse osmosis or osmotic type membranes. If we look at membrane distillation, and again we're looking at estrone and estradiol, we see that we can get near 100% rejection. So there's a definite benefit there if we're talking about emerging and also traditional contaminants. The third advantage um, is that it's compatible with thermal energy. It's not that other things aren't, but this is just a very elegant solution to use something like a salt gradient solar pond where you not only collect but also store solar energy. This is something we looked at in our labs previously. And you use the stored energy or the heat to drive membrane distillation. But there's no reason, you know, it has to be a salt gradient solar pond. It could also be solar thermal, geothermal. Or what we're looking at now, and a lot of people are looking at, which is waste heat. And I'll show you a couple of examples of waste heats that we're trying to tap into to, to drive a membrane distillation system. So these two advantages lead me to these, what I'm calling newer applications of membrane distillation and what I am also calling treatment of low fouling and scaling feed waters, just to differentiate them from the produced waters. And the first of those is water polishing. We know that things like low molecular weight organics, urea, boron, and arsenic can pass through reverse osmosis membranes and can be a problem. Boron's a very big problem for seawater RO. So that led us to a project um, looking at removing these contaminants for small water systems, and I'll talk about that. Um, the second low fouling and scaling feed water could be a forward osmosis draw solution. And if we reconcentrate that using waste heat, again, I'll classify that as a newer application of membrane distillation. And that's led us to a project for an integrated osmotic membrane bioreactor system for wastewater treatment and remote applications. So these are the two applications I'll talk about. I'll start with the EPA application for small water systems. So this might go to the distributed systems that David's talking about, was talking about earlier. So the overview is, um, or, or, or just in terms of using MD, we propose that it was ideal for small systems, especially in a complex regulatory environment where they're trying to meet lots of requirements. It's a simple treatment train, a membrane module, a couple of low pressure pumps. You get broad spectrum contaminant removal. And if you're thinking, wait, what about volatiles? I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and you can also operate it with low grade waste heat. So our objectives were to characterize the range of contaminants, or in EPA's word, contaminant classes that we could remove with membrane distillation, develop a small-scale pilot system with an adaptable heat exchanger, and then deploy the system and use on-site with waste heat. Two hypotheses that we were looking at at the bench scale would that, were that MD would essentially remove 100% of non-volatiles, and that removal of volatiles and semi-volatiles would follow Henry's law. So I'll just briefly show you some of our bench scale results. These were for ions and, the met and metals. We looked, in terms of ions, we looked at um, chromium, fluoride, and sulfate. And what you're looking at here, this is concentration. These are feed concentrations, which it's becoming concentrated, so the feed concentrations are increasing over time. And then our distillate concentrations, which you can see are pretty low, less than two milligrams per liter. Uh, we did, we, we, we were considering if we were getting some sulfate transport, but we actually think um, the little bit of, or the lack of high sulfate rejection was simply due to having sulfate in the DDW that we were using. Uh, and then we also looked at metals, arsenic, boron, and chromium. 
Uh, again, the feed, concentrating with time, and then the distillate. Now, in the distillate, we did see some boron passage, which was kind of interesting because we were interested. We're interested in MD because of boron's passage through RO membranes. So we're not sure the mechanisms of this yet. We are looking at it, but we have seen that it does seem to increase with increasing feed boron concentrations. So, so some additional things to look at. Right now, we're moving into the volatiles and semi-volatiles. Um, at the same time, we're beginning work on our pilot scale preparations, and this took work because we had to lay a fair amount of groundwork with our facility staff because we wanted to tap into a boiler flue gas to take waste heat from there. It provides a lot of waste heat. It's a little bit dirty waste heat, but a lot of waste heat. And so we're working with a colleague in mechanical engineering, basically with a flange design that was very agreeable to facilities folks because we could pop it into the side of the flue and then when we're done, pop it back out. Um, we did use a fin tube heat exchanger to maximize the heat exchange, probably not necessary in this scenario, but that's something the ME faculty wanted to do. So. so, okay, now what I want to do is move into membrane distillation and also the use of forward osmosis, and this is a membrane bioreactor system for wastewater treatment in remote applications. So in this system, we start with a bioreactor. Um, instead of a typical membrane bioreactor where you'd have a microfiltration or ultrafiltration membrane submerged, we have a forward osmosis membrane. So, so we're getting more rejection here. Um, low pressure though, so hopefully not more fouling. Um, of course, if we're using forward osmosis, we need the draw solution loop along with it. So our draw solution comes in. Water is pulled from the mixed liquor suspended solids into our draw solution. We get a diluted draw solution and um, that moves into reverse osmosis. We end up with a treated water and a reconcentrated draw solution. So that's the general idea um, that, we, that we started with. And using forward osmosis as a, as a pretreatment for reverse osmosis is really nice because this is a low fouling and low pressure environment. So we should have less fouling on this membrane than we would on a microfiltration or ultrafiltration membrane. And then because of that, hopefully less fouling as well on the reverse osmosis membrane. The other thing is we have a dual osmotic barrier, right? If you have phalance or if you have uh, contaminants that are passing through the membrane with 80, 60, 40 percent removal, now you're taking two cuts at them with two osmotic type membranes. So if we kind of now step back and consider this compared to conventional potable reuse systems, so we've got wastewater, basically Orange County Sand District, and then Orange County Water District, right? It's becoming a little bit more common to replace three of these steps with a membrane bioreactor, but for potable applications, you still have to follow that with reverse osmosis and advanced oxidation processes. Uh, taking it a step further, if we used an osmotic membrane bioreactor um, followed by reverse osmosis, we would expect to have high contaminant removal because, like I said, we've got these two osmotic barriers, reduced operating and maintenance, less fouling inside the bioreactor, and then less fouling in the downstream RO. Perhaps improved energy consumption. You're going to have to operate this reverse osmosis at higher energy because now you're reconcentrating a draw solution. So the energy question was out there. So we kind of took the next step forward, which was why not use membrane distillation instead of reverse osmosis? So let's replace this electrical energy intensive process with a waste heat recovery process. In doing that, we might get higher contaminant removal. Now we've got one osmotic type barrier along with a di uh, distillation barrier, so two different types of uh, dual barrier. Um, re the, the same operating and maintenance in general, but now lower electrical energy consumption, assuming we have a waste heat source for the membrane distillation. So that's what we propose to cert up and are now moving forward with. It's the OMBR with membrane distillation for potable reuse at military forward operating bases. And so you see we've got the osmotic membrane bioreactor. Uh, we will be, we, we are in the process of working on 
aerobic anoxic cycling so that we can get nitrogen removal in addition to organics. Uh, we're reconcentrating with membrane distillation. Of course, to do that, we need a waste heat source. Um, that was actually kind of the easy, port, easy part when you consider military forward operating bases because we know there they have a lot of diesel generators. And with those generators, you have a, a smallish chunk going to actually the electricity and a larger chunk being wasted. So we want to tap into this larger chunk with two different types of heat exchangers. Um, that larger chunk is the engine coolant or the exhaust gas. And um, that's where we're working with the mechanical engineering faculty member again on, on the heat exchangers needed to bring those to membrane distillation. So just some a back of the envelope calculation, if we had a, an example forward operating base like Camp Leatherneck uh, with 10,000 soldiers, 19 megawatt max power capacity, um, it would result in 29 megawatt thermal recoverable waste heat. If that's supplied to the membrane distillation system, maybe we can supply 9,000 soldiers. So that's, this, this is our target. So briefly, I'll talk about the aerobic anoxic cycling. We wanted to have a single biological treatment reactor. So what we wanted to do was set that reactor up with um, real-time chemical sensors, so nitrogen, dissolved oxygen, ORP, pH, conductivity. Also, we look at TOC and biomass offline. And we use those to cue the air on in the system, so we get organic degradation, nitrification, and look at the chemical cues then to switch to an anoxic environment where we can get denitrification to occur. So this part's very complex. It's good that I'm working with somebody who uh, likes looking at microbial ecology in those conditions because not only are we looking at air on, air off, we're also, you have to consider that with the forward osmosis, you're going to have reverse salt transport inside the bioreactor. So some of the salt will actually go into the bioreactor. It eventually levels off due to wasting, but you do have your microorganisms exposed to higher salt concentrations and higher temperatures from the membrane distillation. So it's, it, it's um, kind of new directions that we're looking at. Uh, we're also looking at the membrane fouling. It's pretty well known from the work that Zahi Kath has done that air scour is effective to maintain flux in long-term operation. But of course, that's under aerobic conditions. So what happens when we turn the air off? Uh, we're looking at sorry, osmotic backwashing, which is just, sorry, <laughs> where you have the membrane, um, as you begin to foul the membrane, you get a layer buildup on the membrane. With osmotic backwashing, it's a low energy, uh, very low intensive approach to cleaning the membrane. So if we replace this draw solution with just water, reverse the direction of flow, hopefully break up that fouling layer. So. What we eventually hope to do is cycle these. We have the air scour and then the osmotic backwashing. Uh, so our bench scale FO system, we can look at the osmotic backwashing. We're also, uh, we've developed an air scour cell. Uh, and in this cell, there's an air inlet, uh, an aeration manifold, which basically distributes the air bubbles across the entrance to the cell. And this way we can kind of look at the mechanisms of two-phase flow, the air and the water across the membrane surface. Very preliminary results. Uh, we're looking at flux as a function of time. Clean water flux is around 11 LMH. And what we see is that we're getting pretty similar results with air scour and osmotic backwash that we can maintain 6 LMH pretty easily. It, most likely we'll want to take that higher. We, we looked at this combination, even though that's not what, something we intend to do eventually, but we were able to maintain higher fluxes doing the combined air scour and osmotic backwash. This is at, at the same time that we're doing the bench scale, we're also building a pilot scale with this system. Uh, this is the OMBR system that uh, HTI donated to us, which was great. Uh, right now we're using reverse osmosis for the draw solution reconcentration and we're working on developing the MD system. 
Okay, last project, but I couldn't leave this one off. It's, it's, it's an interesting one. So this is pressure retarded osmosis. No membrane distillation here. We're taking some of the forward osmosis concepts into pressure retarded osmosis for low energy desalination. Um, I, I like this. It's my one background slide. I think it best describes what PRO is. Uh, if you've got a river meeting the sea and you separate with a membrane under osmosis, water will pass from the fresh water into the seawater pressure chamber. Water that overflows, spins a hydroturbine, generates electricity. Um, a key to this system is you have to, in PRO, you have to have the back pressure. Here it's provided by this pressure chamber. Um, and I, I will say this too, in PRO what we're talking about is the transformation of chemical potential to hydraulic potential. The minute osmosis occurs and the water crosses the membrane, that chemical potential is becoming hydraulic potential. Uh, this is what a more typical system might look like. You've got fresh water coming into the feed solution side, seawater coming into the draw solution side. Under osmosis, water goes from the feed to the draw. Excess water that permeates the membrane is then used to spin a hydroturbine, generate electricity. You can use the electricity for the pumps on site, or it could go as net power. Um, the energy produced is a function of the flux through the membrane, and the flux through the membrane is a function of the osmotic pressure difference. So what I've shown you here is what's, uh, what, Stott, what is known, um, Stockcraft is known for, and that's river to sea PRO, because we're using seawater and maybe river water here. With river to sea PRO, we know we're limited to, to an osmotic pressure difference of about 340 PSI. But if instead of using the seawater, we replace that with something like an RO brine, we could essentially double our driving force, maybe 600 PSI. And that's what we moved forward on with our system that we call the Row Pro system. So for the Row Pro system, if you consider just a coastal water system, you've got along the sea, or you've got a seawater desalination facility providing drinking water to your city. And you know you also have a high salinity brine that needs to be returned to the sea. Um, you also have wastewater leaving the city, going into a wastewater treatment facility, and then treated wastewater also being discharged. So we have two waste streams being discharged to the sea. What if we combine these into what we call this PRO energy recovery facility? So to explain that, I'm going to start just with seawater desalination. Um, in seawater desalination, you have a pressurized feed stream entering your RO module, the concentrate being returned. We know now that it's industry standard to use a pressure exchanger to bring the high pressure in the concentrate back to the feed. And what that does is decreases our feed pumping requirements of big energy savings. But the concentrate also has high salinity. And simply discharging this to the sea is an environmental concern, and especially in California has caused significant regulatory and permitting issues. So what we want to do is use PRO as an osmotic pump to pull water from a wastewater source, bring that volume of water to this higher pressure, send that back, and hopefully have even reduced pumping requirements. So we have energy generation. Again, it can go back to the pumps, which is what we're doing. It could also go as net energy. At the same time, we're getting dilution of our concentrate stream. It should be diluted back to seawater concentration upon discharge. Uh, we spent about a year um, doing, uh, uh, p developing a PRO model and a Row Pro model. Then we moved forward with constructing a system that we operated at Alamogordo, New Mexico. That's a Bureau of Reclamation facility and in our labs. Um, the configuration generally was reverse osmosis, pressure retarded osmosis, and a pressure exchanger. We were looking at the specific energy required of the system, so that was just looking at flow rates, pressure differences, and we assumed a pump efficiency of 80 percent. A key to this system, when we began this work in designing this system, we were using HTI's membrane, uh, water permeability, salt permeability, structural parameter. By the time we went to put membranes into the system, that membrane was no longer available and we used um, an OASIS membrane. 
And what you'll see is we had an order of magnitude higher water permeability, order of magnitude lower salt permeability. So you might say, great, you got a better membrane. But what that meant for our small pilot system was significant operational challenges. Our system wasn't designed for that. Um, so we were unable to operate at high flow rates and fully utilize the membranes, but we still were able to get some interesting results. Uh, these were the results that we got, and that we're comparing RO alone to RO with a pressure exchanger. What you see is uh, about 35% difference, so a savings there. But then when we went to Rho Pro, we had this significant increase, which we pretty quickly knew why. We had just kind of overlooked it in the beginning. Um, and I'll explain that in a minute. The key thing was we proved that the energy from a volume of water transferred from atmospheric pressure to elevated pressure across a semi-permeable membrane could be utilized to pre-pressurize RO feed water. Simply, what that means is we could transfer energy from PRO to RO. That was exciting. We felt it was successful. We also published the first experimental power density data for the Rho Pro system. Uh, these numbers that we got were higher than the river to sea existing power density data, and they closely approach the 5 watts per meter squared that's been designated as making osmotic these osmotic processes viable. We weren't able to achieve our projected energy reductions, and that's because we we were accepting a pressure drop right here. We really needed a second pressure exchanger leaving here. We were at 600 PSI. We had to drop to about 200 PSI. So we were missing that 400 PSI. So our generation two system that we are excited to, uh, to start soon would involve the implementation of a second pressure exchanger. Oops, I clicked too fast. That would hopefully bring our specific energy numbers down in this region. But more than that, we would also design this system for the higher flow rates. Um, and in doing so, we would hopefully get an even better number right in here for specific energy. Last thing, uh, we did not consider pretreatment. If we are using an impaired water source, we would have to pretreat that. Uh, it might cost us 0.2 to 0.3 kilowatt hour per cubic meter. But one significant advantage of RoPro versus the river to CPRO is we get a free draw solution pretreatment, right? The concentrate from the RO has already been pretreated before entering the RO. So a free pretreatment there is, a, is definitely a good bonus. So uh, the higher salinity gradient in RoPro system is likely to make it a more promising component of an alternative energy portfolio than the river to CPRO systems. It also provides concentrate dilution, which may be significant in California in particular. Uh, PRO membranes have improved an order of magnitude over the past three years. We still need commercial competition, new membranes, new modules. Um, and that's also true for forward osmosis and membrane distillation. These hybrid systems and combinations with existing RO can meet our contaminant and ener energy challenges due to different water sources, due to treatment needs, or energy availability and sustainability considerations. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge Bureau of Reclamation, CERDUP, EPA STAR, uh, several industrial partners, collaborators, students, and that's it. So, question from the audience. Uh, Summer. Close to that microphone. <laughs> uh, Amy, thank you very much. Very good uh, presentation. Um, I'm optimistic about membrane distillation. And um, the first part, which is handling the waste heat to create the energy, is I think we have been focusing on it uh, too much, actually. But now the other part is to create a delta T is the cooling of the water. So. If you are close to an ocean, that would be an easy problem. But if you are inland, I think that would be more complicated problem. So I want to know what's your thoughts on this. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Oh, shoot. That's a great question. Um, in the system that I, the CERDUP system that I showed you, we were expecting to have some cooling capacity in our draw solution tank. Um, and with our incoming wastewater, we had a couple of places that we expected to be able to take care of the cooling we needed but now we're finding that we're not. And so uh, we have an overheated system in areas that we don't. So I agree, it's a, it's a problem. It's something we're working on. 
other questions. Yes, Phil, uh, microphone here. I'll say it out loud. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, he's going. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> You made a comment about zero liquid discharge that this approach is more likely to move us towards zero liquid discharge. Did I misunderstand you? Or? Uh, no, we actually, that's, yeah, in the, we we're, were looking at the concentration of our O'Briens at Eastern Municipal Water District. Right now, they discharge to the Sari line. The Sari line is getting full, it's expensive. Um, and so they were looking for other solutions. We had the joyful task of uh, looking at the technology alone, no economy considered. So we were using MDFO, combined MDFO, to, uh, to approach, and we did approach, uh, I, th I think the best we got was about 99% recovery. So we approached zero liquid discharge. We were not considering um, economics of doing that. Okay, time for one more question. Yes, there. Here. Who, who will run first? It's a race. <laughs> she won. Okay, is the resident bean counter in the, in the audience here uh, projected cost on this? Uh, would be one question, you know, on, on a per acre foot basis, which is what the water industry understands here. And... Uh, and number two, I mean, have you looked at, you know, places where you have a great difference in the salinity of the water, like some of the drain water coming out of Arizona versus the Colorado River water, a great difference, or the temperature difference between uh, water, you know, pumped up from 2,000 feet, which, you know, is pretty warm water versus, you know, you know, ocean water or regular surface water. Good. I'll answer the second one first. We'll go with the easiest, and maybe we'll forget the first one. <laughs> um, so, uh, you, existing waste heat, yes. This project started when I was in Nevada. There are uh, locations where their groundwater is too hot and needs to be cooled prior to um, using it for drinking water purposes. So, there is, there's waste heat in reservoirs like that. Um, in terms of any salinity gradient works, I mean, the higher the salinity gradient, the better off you are. So the, the Arizona um, groundwater, I think it was groundwater that you mentioned, that would be a very viable, um, viable means. Discharging to the sea is nice. This, this is it's the simplest version that we've seen, that what we've put together here. Uh, in terms of cost, we, we've a few times looked, start, began looking at cost um, because the membranes are not made on a commercial scale, because nothing is made on a commercial scale. Everything is boutique. Everything's expensive. I don't have a projection for you now. Sorry. So maybe I should just skip that do, question. Do, do the, the hot water from a nuclear power plant or any kind of power plant? Definitely. Definitely. Yep. Okay, I think we're 10 minutes behind, so let's uh, thank all the speakers for the excellent talks.